This documentary was made possible with the help of NordVPN. Click the link in the description and use promo code PUBLISHX for a generous 70% off discount and support the channel in the process. I can honestly say, you know, uh, there was a, a period in my life where I was in high school and um, I used to have trouble, you know, going to sleep at an early hour because I used to sit there and, and dream about hearing my name called, you know, at a Grammy nomination. And the Grammy goes to take care. In 1984, Dennis Graham was on tour as a drummer with Jerry Lee Lewis, performing at the Skyline Hotel in Toronto. After the show, Dennis went to grab himself a drink at the bar, and he noticed a woman sitting next to him smoking a cigarette. He asked if he could bum a cig off of her, and after a few minutes, he had her laughing. Her name was Sandra. Over the next couple years, they would date. On October 24th, 1986, their son, Aubrey Drake Graham, was born. You could say when Aubrey was born, he already had music in his blood from his dad's side of the family. They were all musicians at one point in time. Aubrey was always attending their shows or sitting in on the recording sessions. He spent his early childhood living with both parents off Weston Road in Toronto. The west end of town wasn't the nicest area in Toronto, but it's what his parents could afford at the time. However, Aubrey's life would take a different turn when his parents separated when he was just five. Dennis wanted to go back to Memphis in hopes of finding success in his music career. He packed his bags and left, planning on visiting Aubrey during the summers. Tragically, Dennis quickly found himself in trouble with the law and spent a lot of time in and out of jail. This would put a strain on his relationship with his son. He wasn't able to visit him as often as he wanted, and in Aubrey's eyes, his dad was absent. Staying on Weston Road, Aubrey and his mom would live off her income. They struggled financially, but she always wanted her son to pursue his creative side. She didn't want their financial situation to get in the way of her son's future. Strongly believing there was something great about him, Sander would take her son to an advertising agency in hopes of helping him get discovered. The agent they hired thought Aubrey was extremely talented, and at just five years old, he was already doing shoots for catalogs and small commercials. But when he wasn't in school or auditioning, he loved playing hockey. He even played for the Western Red Wings for a while, until he was cross-checked in the neck and his mom wouldn't let him play anymore. This meant he spent more time at home, listening to songs and discovering his love for music. This laid the road to Aubrey's musical path. He finally found what he was passionate about and would only get more involved over the next several years. Now that Dennis was out of trouble with the law, he was able to bring Aubrey down to Memphis every summer to visit. This gave him a unique perspective. On one hand, he was used to Toronto's lifestyle, and on the other, he was in the heart of Memphis getting inspiration from an entirely different culture, like 3-6 Mafia. By now, he was already experimenting with writing raps and freestyling. Around 1997, Sander decided to move to the Forest Hills neighborhood. Even though this was a much nicer side of town, she found an affordable listing for the downstairs and basement of a home. Their new home had other renters upstairs, while she lived downstairs, and Aubrey had his own room in the basement. I do music. These are full from front to back of just songs. Pages and pages of lyrics and ideas. Something that I'll probably never use. By the time he was attending Forest Hill High School, he was active in acting programs. But he still had his passion for writing lyrics. One day, one of Aubrey's friends found his book full of lyrics and called him out to rap battle another student. Aubrey went home that night and wrote a verse. The next day during school lunch, he won the rap battle. In his own words, he destroyed him. Even though he cheated by writing down the lyrics before the battle, he says this was the real start to him feeling comfortable at rapping. Shortly after, one of Aubrey's friends introduced him to his dad, who was a casting agent for the show titled Degrassi. He encouraged him to try out for the new season that was set to shoot soon. I was gonna wait till tomorrow. I think you might need this now. Happy anniversary. After his audition, he got a call congratulating him on his part as Jimmy Brooks on Degrassi's upcoming season. 
he was only 15. Despite all this good news and what it meant for Aubrey's acting career, life at home was beginning to fall apart. Unfortunately, his mom had gotten sick, and she wasn't able to provide like she used to. She was taking pills and smoking cigarettes to avoid the pain. Drake says he was watching her kill herself. It was a low point, and he was doing what he could to help out. He was working full time doing shoots, but there was still less income than his mom had made as a teacher. He then transferred to Vaughn Road Academy, a high school that was closer to Degrassi's shoots. He was outcast and bullied for his race and religious background. He was attending school, but he rarely found himself mentally there. Instead, he was focused on filming, since the season heavily featured him. This would lead to him dropping out altogether and focusing all his attention on acting. Over the next year, Aubrey continued his role as Jimmy on Degrassi, but he was feeling unfulfilled. His love for music had only grown more over this time. He couldn't help but come home and write songs in his notebook late into the night. He decided to use some of his acting money and invested in a studio microphone, where he started to record his earliest songs in his basement. With his popularity growing as an actor, he started meeting more people. Some of them were like him and had dreams of working on music. One evening in a nightclub with his friends Voice and D10, they ended up running into a girl named Melanie Fiona who was a singer. Drake, myself, <laughs> producer he works with and tours with and another artist from Toronto. We used to gig together. We were part of a group together. After talking for a while, the four of them started discussing forming a group of their own. They decided on the name The Renaissance. Aubrey, who had already decided he wanted to be known by his middle name Drake, was one of the two singers on the group. They started to gain some local attention and had hopes of going on tour outside of the city, but it wouldn't last long. Unfortunately, in 2005, the group decided to disband and pursue solo careers. While Drake still had his career on Degrassi to fall back on, he was also starting to appear in movies as well, like Us and Them, Soul Food, and Spring Break. Which brings us to our sponsor for this video, NordVPN. If you plan on streaming this Spring Break, did you know you're missing out on hundreds of movies and TV shows that are hidden just because of where you live? With the VPN, you simply connect where you want around the world and unblock content in a matter of seconds. Set your location to any one of the fast and secure servers. Keep your information safe when you use public Wi-Fi and have peace of mind knowing it comes with 24-7 customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if there's a movie in another country you've been wanting to watch, simply connect and NordVPN will take care of the rest. Click the link and use coupon code PUBLISHX to sign up with a limited time 70% off discount. Thank you. Now back to Drake. With a handful of movie and episode appearances, Aubrey would run into another local rapper named Promise while he was on set filming. Promise saw potential in Drake and he invited him to start using his personal studio for recording, which he had fully equipped with pianos, speakers, and different engineers. This was a much nicer studio than Drake's basement, and he could get his mixing down better with traffic that was coming through. Drake grabbed his lyric book and started working on his first mixtape. I met Drake back in 2006, another guy named D10 that, that I work with that plays keys. Okay. And he would always tell me about, about Drake. He's like, yo man, I got this, this boy. Like he's on that TV show, Degrassi, but <laughs> I mean, he could really rap. And I was, I was really just like, oh, I know who that is. Like, you know, the light skinned guy from Degrassi, I was like. <laughs> D10 would keep in touch with Drake even after the renaissance and introduced him to a local producer who was getting a small buzz. That producer was named Boy Wanda. Now Aubrey had a studio and beats. All he was missing was the music. He started recording music as often as he could and he would occasionally perform songs live around the city. Even as early as 2005, Drake was posting music on his MySpace and messaging other artists to link up. One of the artists he messaged and got a hold of was Nicholas F, who was a freestyler from Virginia. Drake was already a fan, so this was the perfect opportunity for him to collab on a song. The two made plans to meet up and work. This gave Drake the chance to get his foot in the door over in the United States. He says Virginia showed him love, and when he got there it quickly started to pay off as he was meeting a lot of new people. Collabing with a few Virginia artists like Nicholas F was enough for Drake to get introduced to Trey Songs. Trey Songs was blowing up at the time and their paths cross. Trey had the singing down and Drake could rap the verses. He knew they had to collab on a song as soon as possible. They ended up working together and this gave him his first real industry collab. 
He needed this in order to break out of just being seen as an actor. He plays a musician on TV, but Degrassi's Aubrey Graham has a CD dropping in February for real. In February 2006, his first mixtape titled Room for Improvement was released. The tape was hosted by DJ Smalls under his popular Southern Smoke series, and it featured Trey songs on the About the Game freestyle, their first song together. At the time, DJ Smalls had hosted tapes for popular artists like Lil Wayne and Jeezy, so this was a smart move by Drake. It sold 6,000 copies throughout 2006, which may seem small, but to him it was everything. It gave him all the motivation he needed. But he was still trying to pursue acting and music at the same time. He'd spend all day on set and go to the studio until 4 or 5 a.m. He was working all night with traffic on the way home. During the fourth season in episode 7, Drake's character Jimmy freestyles during a school talent show. It was ironic because only people who followed him outside the show knew he had been working on music off camera. Let me show you what it is. House birthed up top. I was raised at the bottom of the neck with a Feeling confident after the release of Room for Improvement, Drake began working on his second mixtape. While working on new music, he had another unreleased single he wanted Trey Songs to sing on the hook. They linked up again, this time in Atlanta, and recorded their second song together, Replacement Girl. The song would end up being the lead single off Drake's second mixtape, Comeback Season, released in September of 2007. Although the tape showed massive improvement from his first, Replacement Girl stood out from the rest. The song blew up and they ended up filming a music video for it. And um, you know, these are all wonderful ladies that came out to uh, audition for the video and hopefully be a part of it. At the same time the music video was being filmed, Drake would meet another producer from Toronto, Noah Shabib, who was known as 40. 40 would quickly become the backbone to Drake's production. Replacement Girl and his music video were picked up by television and featured on BET's 106 in Park. This made Drake the first unsigned Canadian artist to ever feature on the show. At this point, he was more invested in his musical career over his acting. He was exhausted on set from staying up all night, and the producers of Degrassi started to notice. He was juggling two professions, and they told him he needed to choose. Drake chose music. Taking a leap of faith and trusting that his music was on the right path, he was kicked off the show, leaving music as his only way out. He made a game plan on how he planned to break into the industry, utilizing his ability to both rap and sing. To start singing, it was because of something that my father had told me, which was, you know, there's no rapper out there that sings and raps and does it well. With two mixtapes out and now a popular following on MySpace, he started to catch the attention of record labels. After multiple offers, Drake felt the labels were not seeing the vision he had for himself and his OVO brand, so he passed on all of them. Even though it wasn't easy to walk away from these offers, he still believed somebody would take notice of his potential. And they did, from an unexpected place. Rap a Lot Records was a label based out of Houston, Texas, and had a huge name in Southern hip hop. Jazz Prince, the son of rap founder, Jay Prince, heard Drake's music on MySpace and saw massive potential in him. Jazz reached out, leveraging his connections with Southern rappers and promising him he could help him. Having known about rap a lot already, Drake was excited to bring Jazz on board with him. Jazz quickly took Drake's music to Lil Wayne, and his life changed forever. You know, I told him that I had an artist I was looking at. And at that time, you know, they told me he wasn't really looking for artists, and Wayne told me he sucked. We were driving down West time, I'm like, Mm, let me play some Drake, even though he told me don't play this shit no more. I went on and played another song, and he was like, this dude is, is pretty he's pretty nice. I was like, I told you. So he was like, let's call him. So I called him. And at the time, Drake was sitting at the barbershop. You know, I got a call from his number. I was getting a haircut, so I picked up the phone, and it, and it was like, I was like, hello. And I was like, yeah, what's that? Then when, you know, like, I was just like, what? Yeah. Drizzy, baby. At the time, Lil Wayne was a part of Birdman's Cash Money Records, and arguably the biggest artist out. Wayne had been exploring the idea of starting his own extension of Cash Money. He wanted to name it Young Money and sign new talent that was on the rise. With Drake now on his radar, he gave him a call, stating he wanted to hear more music. After their phone conversation, Wayne invited Drake out to Houston to join him on the Carter III tour. Throughout the tour, they would record multiple songs together, including the song Ransom and Forever. After and during the tour, Drake started to gain massive exposure. He knew it was time to drop another project while he had this momentum. This is not to get confused. This one's for you. 
Shortly after, in February 2009, he released So Far Gone, which featured Trey songs, Lloyd, Omarion, and a number of Lil Wayne features. Surprisingly, the 10th song on the tape, Best I Ever Had, would be the standout song, despite having multiple collabs with bigger artists. Best I Ever Had peaked at number 2 on the Billboard 100 and became Drake's first ever top 10 song. This song transformed Drake's entire career. Every high school played it during assemblies and everyone was listening to it on their iPhone first generation. He now had the world's attention. With the start of a new era, Young Money would officially bring him on board, signing him. I go by the name of Drake, Jimmy Valentino, Jersey Drake Rogers, Young Angel, you know what it is. Yeah. For the rest of 2009, Drake would work with Lil Wayne to build up hype for his first album. By this time, he was fully engulfed with the Young Money team. Lil Wayne, Nicki Minaj, and even a 20-year-old Tyga would all represent the brand. They released the song and video for Bedrock with huge success, and the world was taking notice of them. Everyone in the music game was watching. It was time to start working and finalizing Drake's first album. Do it the way The Weeknd did it. Do it the way Party Next Door did it. Do it the way I did it, you know? Do it from where you're at. Thank Me Later was released on June 15, 2010 with critical acclaim, and even critics couldn't deny how well put together it was. For the start of a new decade, Drake had collabs with Kanye West, Eminem, and even Rihanna. He was looking to be the most promising artist. Songs like Forever and What's My Name would be played on the radio non-stop. But things would only get better in November of 2011. He had been working on a new project, and he knew it was something special. Like I'm a good 80% done. I, I have a line on the album where I say, you know, I feel like I was numb to it last year, but I think I feel it now more than ever. That's probably the best, the best way I could paint the picture for you for this album. Drake's second studio album, Take Care, was released, and it brought him to the forefront of the mainstream. The album showcased massive improvement from his first project just four years before. It debuted at number one and sold over 600,000 copies its first week. Those were crazy numbers. At this point, it was almost impossible to not hear Drake on the radio or in the club. Not only was it well received by fans, but it was the start of an unstoppable run that still hasn't slowed for Drake. He continued to maintain his spot at the top for years to come. But keeping this spot had a lot to do with the smart business moves he made and not just his music. Aside from his connections to YMCMB, he also brought to life his OVO brand, a label, clothing company, and radio show. This allowed him to prove that he was much more than just another member of Young Money. He followed this into his third album, building an extraordinary hype. Nothing Was the Same was released in September of 2013. It had songs like Just Hold On, We're Going Home, and Started From The Bottom. This project would once again receive overwhelming positive reviews and gave us summer hits that entire year. It took on a different theme from what we previously saw in Take Care. This opened everyone's eyes and made us realize that maybe Drake had so much more to offer. Even critics couldn't guess what Drake was going to do next. In 2013, he also started looking to sign new artists and talent to his own label, much like Lil Wayne had done for him. This would include artists like Party Next Door, Roy Woods, and for a brief time, McConan. When he wasn't signing artists, he was scouting new talent, hopping on features like Versace to promote the new group called Migos. Helping establish these artists became a priority, along with touring worldwide. This is partially why there was a long three-year period between 2013 and 2016 where he didn't release a new album. Despite this drought for new drops, Drake was still featured on countless hit songs, some of which helped start the careers of other artists. But fans weren't completely left out, and in February of 2015, without any warning, Drake would drop a new mixtape. If you're reading this, it's too late sounded more like an album, but if anything, it showed just how massive he had become, selling 495,000 copies its first week. Not many artists can get away with releasing projects with little or no promotion and still top the Billboard charts. This only built more hype around his next album, which fans had been patiently waiting for. But instead of an album, he released yet another mixtape, this time collabing with Future and Metro Boomin for What A Time To Be Alive. In a time where hip-hop was changing, Drake showed no signs of not being able to keep up. Then came Drake's next project. It's a shame if you don't notice the shift in energy around you. I mean, you can't be oblivious to what's going on around you. And I just, I just like kind of woke up one day like, yo, this is my, this is my time. This is my like, I like, this is my thing. I run this, you know. Just one year later, he not only delivered, but shattered all previous accomplishments yeah. with his fourth studio album, Views. Every song on the project would chart on the billboard, surprising everyone. Keeping the momentum going, he released his mixtape More Life in early 2017, before once again taking a break from new music. This break was questioned by critics as it didn't seem to make much sense to slow down the massive momentum he now had. 
but he had a plan and yet again he proved everyone wrong when he returned in 2018. Releasing multiple hit songs like In My Feelings and his biggest song to date, God's Plan, which racked up billions of streams and changed lives. In addition to his solo music, he was featured on songs like Yes Indeed with the new artist Lil Baby and Look Alive, Blockboy JB. Just like that, he was back like he never left, and virtually every song he touched would go platinum. At this point, he had won over an entirely new generation of listeners who may not have known about him in his Young Money roots. From 2018 to present, he's dropped an additional two albums and multiple mixtapes and is yet to fall out of the spotlight. The story of Drake's success is rare but entirely achievable. With the help of a solid team and the right people willing to take a chance on you, he's shown that anything is possible.